Okay, let's talk about one particular type of buffer that's very important clinically, um, and that's the blood buffering system in humans. It turns out that your blood has a particular pH, and that pH is really, really important to maintain clinically. Your blood's about at a pH of 7.4. If it gets too low, really just 7.3, or too high, 7.5, um, you have real bad clinical symptoms. And the pH of the blood is one of the first things checked when someone comes into the emergency room or clinic to see how the buffering system is holding up. Because changes in the blood pH can be uh, not only a bad thing, but they can be a diagnostic tool to figure out what, uh, what's wrong with the patient. Now, there's lots of buffering components in the blood. Um, and here's three of the main categories here on this slide. Um, one of the most prevalent proteins in your blood, non-hemoglobin proteins, is albumin. Albumin has a pKa of 7.4, which is really handy because that's the pH at which you want to keep that your blood, uh, which means that you have an uh, equal amount of the acidic form of albumin and the basic form of albumin. But the buffering capacity of your blood, only about 14% of that is due to albumin's role. Um, the molecule with the biggest buffering capacity in your blood is hemoglobin, which has a pKa of 6.8. Now that's not too far away from 7.4, but that obviously means there's more acidic hemoglobin than basic hemoglobin um, in that ratio for Henderson-Hasselbach. And that has an 80% buffering capacity. Now the last um, buffering system that we're going to talk about only has a 6% buffering capacity, this bicarbonate carbonic acid. However, it's the most important, arguably, buffering system in your blood, and that's because it's most quickly changed and regulated. It can respond really quickly to change the amounts of carbonic acid and bicarbonate in order to respond to insults to the buffering system. Now, it doesn't have a big buffering capacity, but it's really dynamic. And the other strange thing about it is it's got a, the pKa of carbonic acid is only 6.1, which is weird, right? Because earlier we said usually when you choose buffering components for a particular buffer, you want to choose ones that have a pKa close to the pH at which you want that buffer to be. Um, because you kind of want an equal amount of soldiers, acid and base soldiers, to respond to threats. Now, the carbonic acid buffering system has a very low pH of 6.1 compared to the pH, which really means there's a whole lot more carbonic, um, uh, sorry, there's a whole lot more bicarbonate in that buffering system there than there is carbonic acid, which means that this buffering system is actually has evolved to deal with um, acid insults by having a whole lot more conjugate base soldiers in the buffer to deal with it. And the reality is it, we're much more likely to be insulted with acids, whether they're metabolic acids like lactic acid or other acids from the, uh, the citric acid cycle that build up in our blood, or environmental uh, causes for acid, one, one which we'll see soon. Uh, than bases. It's just much more rare for you to have a problem with your pH being too high. It's really common for a patient to be acidotic and not very common for them to be alkalotic. Okay, so if we look at the bicarbonate by uh, carbonic acid buffering system, it's actually a little more complicated than what we've been dealing with in that we've got two equations here. The real buffering part is here in the second part. Here's carbonic acid. That's our weak acid. It can dissociate from H plus and bicarbonate, or conjugate base, and there's an equilibrium um, here that can be described by its Ka value. And this is the buffering equation. Now, the reason we have this part of the equation is because the production of carbonic acid, it can be, um, the, this can be produced by carbon dioxide and water reacting together. And so we're connecting this buffering system here really to this gas, carbon dioxide, and respiration, right? Um, these 
facts here on the PowerPoint are what we talked about earlier. We really don't have an equal ratio of acid to base. We've got a whole lot more bicarbonate in there than carbonic acid, and that means this buffering system is really good. We're dealing with acid insults, but not really good with base. So how is this buffering system um, you know, regulated, and how can we affect the concentration of these things? The biggest one is respiration, right? So let's think about that for a little bit. What happens when you hold your breath? Well, if you hold your breath, it turns out your pH decreases. You become acidotic, right? And the reason why, or one of the reasons why, is because if you uh, hold your breath, you're increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide in your lungs. If you increase the carbon dioxide in your lungs, that means that you're going to generate more carbonic acid. Higher concentrations of this are going to lead to higher concentrations of carbonic acid, which are going to lead to higher concentrations of H+, therefore a lower pH. Now, while holding your breath causes you to be acidotic, hyperventilation, breathing too fast, can decrease the concentration of carbon dioxide, which decreases the concentration of carbonic acid, which decreases the concentration of H+, increasing the pH. So hyperventilation causes people's pH to go up. Okay? So respiration is a really quick way to affect the concentrations of the components of these buffering systems, and it also is another reason why we're much more likely to see acidosis in a clinic than alkalosis. Someone with problems breathing, either with an obstruction or pulmonary issues, are much more common than someone who comes in and is breathing too hard, right? So any problem with breathing is going to lead to acidosis because of increases in carbon dioxide levels. Now, there's other ways to affect the components of this buffering system. The kidneys are one thing that can remove bicarbonate. They are a little more slow acting than respiration. Your liver, we'll see this a little later, can remove protons um, really through hemoglobin action. And we talked about hemoglobin. Um, hemoglobin, of course, binds to oxygen in your red blood cells, but it also really can bind to protons, H pluses, and transporting them to the liver for removal. This is really useful, right, as a buffering agent. Because if you have highly metabolizing cells, because you're using a lot of energy, uh, they're going to be using up a lot of oxygen, and they're going to be acidotic. And so hemoglobin can come around and deliver oxygen to these rapidly metabolizing tissues, um, and not only delivering oxygen, but they'll also take away the H+, that's making those tissues acidic because of their high metabolism. You know, the other thing that can affect your blood pH is the environment. There's a lot of toxins and drugs which are acidic or basic and can lead to disruptions in your blood buffering system in the ratio of carbonic acid to bicarbonate. Okay, so someone comes in the clinic, you try to figure out what their pH is. How do you determine that? You take the pH of it, right? Duh. Uh, we'll use in the laboratory a pH meter to check a buffer that you guys are going to make for your lab projects, and you can use the equivalent of a pH meter um, in the clinic. Um, uh, the other thing that's often checked are blood gases. You may have heard of blood gases. One of the gases checked is carbon dioxide. It's really done. The carbon dioxide levels are checked in a similar manner to pH. There's an ion selective electrode that can detect the presence of carbon dioxide. And that can uh, tell you about respiration and carbonic acid levels. Um, the other clinically relevant measurement that's done is this, this thing called anion gap. An anion gap is really just a calculation that's done through um, specific ion selective electrodes where you're taking the concentration of sodium and subtracting away chloride plus bicarbonate. So it's sort of the gap between this cation and these anion concentrations. Now, the anion gap, let's try to imagine what would happen to it. Let's say someone has a metabolic issue and is having an increase in lactic acid concentration or any other acid in the, in the citric acid cycle. 
Now, what we know about buffers is that that acid insult would be um, acted upon by this bicarbonate of our buffering system. And therefore, our bicarbonate levels would decrease because this soldier is jumping on our acid insult. Now, if the bicarbonate levels are decreasing, that means that this overall value will be smaller, which means that the overall, sorry, overall anion gap would increase. Okay. So the anion gap has a normal range. If there's a metabolic acid, that anion gap will increase, and that can tell the clinician that bicarbonate levels are likely lower. Okay. Chloride can also be an indication of, of kidney issues. So here's sort of a flow chart that clinicians can use. Here, blood pH is normally about 7.4. If it's too far away from 7.4, someone is going to be exhibiting acidemia or alkalemia. Again, acidemia is much, much more common to be seen. If someone is acidotic or is exhibiting acidemia, you can check their blood gas, bicarbonate levels, um, and if they have increased uh, carbon dioxide through the blood gas, they call it respiratory acidosis. It means they're not expiring or expelling that carbon dioxide and it's leading to increases in carbonic acid. Uh, if you have oh, decreased bicarbonate levels, that means something is you know, reacting with that soldier. That bicarbonate is reacting with some acidic insult. And that acidic insult is probably metabolic acidosis. There's some metabolite which is um, insulting your buffering system. So what is that? Well, you can check the anion gap and see if you got an anion gap uh, due to decrease in bicarbonate or you've got extra chloride in there um, probably because of some kidney issue. Alkalosis, it's either respiratory or you've got, you know, maybe you're throwing up too much or you're retaining um, you're retaining bicarbonate that's increasing your pH. So a clinician can learn a lot just by looking at the pH and doing a few more tests to find out how the buffering system of the blood is, is holding up. Um, here's you know, some other disorders that can affect the anion gap, right? If the diarrhea can lead to decreased bicarbonate levels, chloride is uh, retained, and um, you might see that in on the other tests, but anion gap doesn't have a big effect. Neither does these kidney issues. Lactic acid buildup, maybe due to um, increased exercise or some metabolic issue, um, will decrease bicarbonate levels, increase this acid, and, and increase the anion gap. You may have heard of ketoacidosis. A lot of diabetics um, end up doing uh, you know, they have trouble metabolizing sugars, and so they undergo a lot of muscle-based um, metabolism, breakdown of fatty acids. And one of the byproducts of fatty acid breakdown in the muscle are these ketone bodies, which are a little acidic. And so if someone has untreated uh, or uncontrolled uh, diabetes, they're not regulating it very well these ketone bodies build up and that leads to acidosis um, and a disruption of the blood buffering system. And, and there's other things too. So the anion gap is, is a common way to, to measure these differences. And, and really it, it shows the importance of this carbonic acid bicarbonate buffering system. I'll do a demo in class which shows um, sort of how this works. We'll make a little model of a a lung and the blood buffering system to see how we can alter um, the pH of, of a bicarbonate carbonic acid system. Going.